I'm delighted to be chairing this session this morning, um, a session which looks at the very important issue of durable solutions, the three durable solutions. I'm not going to say much because we have two really great speakers on this topic, and I want to leave as much time as possible for discussion from the audience. The first speaker is Dr. Jeff Crisp, who's head of the Policy and Development and Evaluation Unit at UNHCR headquarters in, pa in Geneva. He's also held senior positions with the Global Commission on International Migration, the Independent Commission on International Humanitarian Issues, and the British Refugee Council. He has a master's degree and PhD from the Center of West African Studies at the University of Birmingham in the UK. I've known Jeff for many years. He's a great colleague to have and a great supporter of civil society's activities in the protection of refugees. And I always like Jeff because he's one of the UNHCR people who speaks out strong and loud on behalf of refugee rights. So with that, I invite Jeff to start the session. Thank you very much. Can everybody at the back hear me? I was sitting there yesterday and I had a bit of trouble hearing everybody. So can you wave your arms if you can hear me at the back? Yeah, great. Okay, very good. Um, thanks. It's really great privilege and pleasure to be back at the University of New South Wales. And I'd like to thank Eileen and the other organizers for the invitation to give this presentation uh, this morning. Um, I'm afraid I've given it a rather long and cumbersome title, so let me quickly read it out. It's called From Permanent Solutions to Inconclusive Outcomes protracted refugee situations, human mobility, and irregularity. And what I'd like to do in the next 15 minutes is to turn the spotlight away a little bit from Australia and the, and the Asia Pacific region, and to take a, light, a slightly more global perspective on the whole issue of solutions to refugee situations. Um, and in case I run out of time, let me give you a quick summary of what the presentation is going to say. And it's going to say that in the absence of permanent solutions, Refugees are increasingly adapting to their situation by developing, by developing alternative life strategies, frequently involving mobility and irregularity. This presentation examines the causes, consequences, and implications of this trend. And I'm going to try out a few new ideas on you. I'm not sure whether they're sustainable ideas, but I'd like to get your reaction from some of the new ideas that I'm going to present this morning in the next few minutes. Okay, let's start. Let's start with the notion of permanent solutions. Quite interestingly, if you look at the 1951 Refugee Convention, you won't find the word solutions or permanent in the 1951 Refugee Convention. But if you turn to the UNHCR statute, which was uh, established at around the same time as the convention, you will indeed see this notion of permanent solutions in the text. And more specifically, the UNHCR statute says that one of the functions of UNHCR is, and I quote, seeking permanent solutions for the problem of refugees. And I think, as everybody in this room knows, over the years, the interpretation of this notion has really focused on three different solutions, on local integration in countries of first asylum, resettlement to third countries, and voluntary repatriation to the country of origin. At some point along the way, and I, nobody's been able to explain it exactly, at some point along the way, the notion of permanent solutions, which you find in the UNHCR statute became the notion of durable solutions, which is perhaps the more popularly used one now. But I've reverted to the original notion in this presentation of permanent solutions as found in the, in the UNHCR statute. And I think, again, as most of you in the room will know, the key characteristic of all the three solutions is that they re-establish the refugees' connection to a state and enable them to enjoy the protection of a state whether it's their country of origin, their country of first asylum, or a resettlement country. So that's a few words about the notion of permanent solutions. But let's move on to look at the way this notion has been applied in practice over the years. And here I want to give a brief historical introduction to this uh, issue. Uh, if you look at the history of refugees from the 1950s onwards, you'll find that there's, there's been a number of phases in terms of the application of these different solutions. In the 1950s, the post-Second World War period, the, the focus was very much on resettlement, more particularly resettlement from Europe. And as we heard yesterday, a considerable number of those people who were resettled from Europe actually came here to Australia. 
In the 1960s and 1970s, the focus really shifted to another strategy, that of local settlement, particularly in Africa, where many new refugee movements were occurring. And the notion here was to give refugees land, enable them to become self-reliant, enable them to feed themselves, so that in the long term they could either integrate in the country of asylum, or if the situation improved in their country of origin, they could then go back by means of voluntary repatriation. In the 1970s and the 1980s, resettlement found its way back onto the solution scene. Uh, more specifically, large-scale resettlement from Southeast Asia, particularly Vietnamese and Cambodian refugees. And again, as we were reminded yesterday, a significant proportion of those people came here to Australia. In the 1990s, we entered, I think, a new phase uh, where voluntary repatriation became the preferred solution. And if you look at successive um, UNHCR executive committee resolutions passed in the 1990s, uh, you'll see lots of references to voluntary repatriation being the preferred solution, the best solution, in some cases even the only solution. Now one of the kind of darker episodes in UNHCR's history also took, part, took place at this time because during the mid-1990s UNHCR also began to flirt with the idea of what I call less than voluntary repatriation and at one point UNHCR actually produced a paper saying that repatriation didn't have to be voluntary as long as it was safe. And in a number of particular operations, I'm thinking particularly of Rohingyas in Bangladesh and Rwandese refugees in Tanzania, uh, refugees were actually pushed back to their country of origin with the uh, implication, implication and the connivance to some extent of UNHCR. It wasn't the most glorious moment in our institutional history. But then if we move on to the most recent decade, I wrote a paper in the year 2000 called No Solutions in Sight. And what I tried to do in that paper was to say that um, increasingly neither local integration, resettlement or voluntary return was available for a growing proportion of the world's refugees. And as a result, we saw the emergence of these long-term or protracted refugee situations in which nobody had an immediate prospect of finding a solution to their plights. What was UNHCR's response to this problem, this growing problem of protracted refugees? Let's look at it for a few minutes. Uh, in 2002, UNHCR produced a document called the Agenda for Protection, which was based on a number of meetings which were called the consultations, global consultations on international protection. And one of the key concepts that you'll find in that document, the Agenda for Protection, is the notion of comprehensive solutions. This was a new concept at that time, so let's take a couple of minutes to look at what it actually meant. The notion of comprehensive solutions tried to get away from previous approaches whereby you focused either on resettlement or on local integration or on voluntary return and said we should adopt a multifaceted approach. In any given refugee situation, we should try all three solutions simultaneously and we should also sh try a differentiated approach. It may be that for some refugees, voluntary return is the best solution. For some refugees, local integration is the best solution and for others, resettlement is the best solution. So getting away from this kind of single uh, approach of the, of the 1950s to the 1990s, a more multifaceted and differentiated approach. It was also a regional approach. It stressed the fact that when refugees leave a country of origin, they often scatter in many directions and go to many different countries, and therefore there's a need for comprehensive solutions to take on board the fact that refugees have to be found in those countries and that you need to adopt a regional approach rather than just looking at one single country of origin and one country of asylum. Another key element of the comprehensive solutions notion was that of international responsibility sharing, that solutions, even if they were found locally, should be supported internationally, particularly by the world's more prosperous donor states. And the notion of comprehensive solutions also introduced a new element in emphasizing the need for interagency cooperation. Until this period, refugee solutions have been very much seen as the responsibility of UNHCR. But from 2000 onwards, we began to stress the importance of other actors being involved, particularly development actors such as UNDP and the World Bank. Also, of course, other organizations such as IOM and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights were also included in this new notion of interagency cooperation in the context of comprehensive solutions. Now, let's look at the attempts that have been made to implement comprehensive solutions. I think the notion of comprehensive solutions is a very sound one in principle. The need for a multifaceted approach, the need for a differentiated approach, 
the need to involve all of the countries in the regions uh, concerned, the need for international responsibility sharing. They're all very sound notions. And you can find some support for the notion in some his historical examples, particularly the comprehensive plan of action for Indo-Chinese refugees and another initiative in the 1980s, SIREFCA, which uh, related to refugees in the Central uh, America region. You can find some examples of this comprehensive solution approach actually succeeding. But in recent practice, I think we have a very mixed record indeed. Let me just give a few examples. In Afghanistan, there's been some limited success with this comprehensive solutions approach, certainly in terms of repatriation. Uh, quite a lot of movement back to Afghanistan has taken place. We've been less successful in getting local integration for refugees in countries such as Pakistan and Iran, and the number of Afghans who have been resettled has been rather limited too. I guess fundamentally the limited success of the Afghanistan situation is the continuation and indeed the intensification of the conflict there, um, which has uh, made many people choose to stay outside of the country. More recently, about four years ago, UNHCR tried to develop a comprehensive solution for the Somalia situation, one of the most, most serious refugee situations in the world at the moment. And to be very honest, it was a complete failure, that comprehensive solution. Why was it a complete failure? Primarily because I think history shows that if you're to have a successful comprehensive solution, you need a government in the country of origin which is able to make commitments and deliver upon them. That was what, exactly what happened with the CPA and with Serefka. As we all know in Somalia, there has been no government for many years, and so trying to implement a comprehensive solution in that context was, I think, a rather foolhardy venture on the part of UNHCR. Tanzania, I don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with the Tanzania situation. There's been quite a concerted effort to bring a comprehensive solution to the situation of Burundian refugees in Tanzania. Um, about half a million refugees went back to Burundi by means of a voluntary repatriation program and around 162,000 have remained in Tanzania and had the opportunity and the possibility of locally integrating there and becoming Tanzanian citizens. So I, I, to sum up Tanzania, I'd say there's good potential, but there are a number of problems both with the voluntary repatriation and the local integration component of that solution. And in a way, as I say on the slide, it's probably too early to judge whether that has been a complete success or not. And I think the other thing we have to take on board is that despite these efforts to bring comprehensive solutions to some of the world's key refugee situations, ref refugee situations in general have continued to become more protracted. I think uh, according to our latest figures we consider around 29 or 30 refugee situations around the world to be protracted in the sense that they've lasted for more than five years and uh, I think on average uh, we work out now the average refugee tends to spend 17 years in a country of asylum before they find a permanent solution to their plight. Now, what I want to move on to now is I've said a little bit about how UNHCR has responded to protracted refugee situations, particularly by means of these comprehensive solutions approaches, but I want to say a little bit more about how refugees themselves have responded. Now, in a recent UNHCR document, uh, I came across this quotation that many refugees around the world, it said, are languishing in camps dependent on international aid. And I've added a question mark to that quotation because I'm not sure it's actually fully true. And I'd like to uh, suggest that as well as languishing in camps dependent on international aid, refugees themselves are actually taking uh, many uh, actions in order to resolve their plight uh, in the absence of comprehensive solutions. Firstly, I think we see that increasingly refugee families, refugee households are really maximizing their opportunities and spreading risk by adopting household-based strategies. What do I mean by that? I mean a typical Somali family may leave one or two family members in Somalia to look after their land and property. One refugee or two refugees may go to Dadab camp in northern Kenya. Uh, other, other Somali members of the family may go down to Nairobi to try their luck there, and yet others may make the long trek, almost 5,000 kilometers, down to South Africa because work is available there. I think you can see a similar uh, situation with regard to Afghan households, splitting up, moving in different directions in order to maximize their opportunities and to spread the risk. Residence in urban areas, I think, is becoming increasingly common for refugees. Rather than going to camps 
Increasingly, we see that refugees are either moving out of camps and moving to urban areas, or they're avoiding camps altogether and are moving straight to urban areas where perhaps better livelihoods opportunities exist. Um, a subject dear to you here down in Australia, um, increasingly we find that refugees are again moving out of camps and are engaging in what we call, not a very elegant phrase, what we call irregular onward movements, moving on from their country of first asylum to countries uh, at a greater distance from the, their own uh, country of origin. And uh, as I say, you see this very much uh, here in Australia, but it's a worldwide phenomenon at the moment leading to all kinds of strange things like a Somali, a Somali community uh, slowly emerging in Costa Rica. Now you just wonder, how do Somalis make it all the way to Costa Rica? It's quite in incredible the way that people engage in such onward movements, often without passports and often without visas, but they manage to do it nevertheless. Increasingly we find that refugees and refugee households and refugee communities are living what I call transnational lifestyles. They're connected up from one country to another. As I said, Somalis, uh, uh, Liberians will be another example. Afghans often have family members in many different locations around the world. And there's a great deal of transactions going on between those different family members, the exchange of information, the exchange of money by means of remittances, the exchange of opportunities to migrate either legally or in an irregular manner. And a growing number of refugees are also spending uh, time in more than one country. Uh, if you went up to the border with Afghanistan and Pakistan, for example, you'd see thousands of people crossing the border every day. People are essentially living a double life, uh, half of the time in Afghanistan, but half of the time in Pakistan. And again, that's something that we see in other situations as well. And then another issue, which I think is a very important one, Increasingly, because people are st stuck in protracted refugee situations and are desperate to move on and to continue with their life. Um, when I originally wrote this, I put exploiting resettlement opportunities, but I felt that was a bit too negative. So I put maximizing resettlement opportunities. What we find around the world today, if you go to any UNHCR office around the world today, you will see growing numbers of refugees desperate to be resettled and using every trick in the book that they can find in order to be resettled. It's a very common phenomenon at the moment. And then something else that I would call de facto local integration. If we look at the situation of Iraqi refugees in Jordan and Syria, for example, they don't have legal residence there. They don't have long-term residence permits there. They're considered to be guests rather than refugees by the two host countries. But because they've been there for a number of years already, you'll, we're finding that slowly but surely they are kind of almost locally integrating into those countries. They're gradually acquiring greater rights. They're finding a niche in society. They're finding a niche in the economy. And it's a process that we are calling de facto local integration. And then finally, another form of irregularity which refugees use to find solutions to their plight is what uh, I've described here as the informal acquisition of citizenship and identity documents in the country of asylum. I saw this very recently in Eastern Sudan. Uh, Eastern Sudan where Eritrean refugees are technically not allowed to locally integrate, but I spoke to the governor of one state and he said that according to his estimates, more than 60% of the Eritrean refugees living in the state had managed by some means or other to uh, acquire Sudanese identity documents and therefore had able to kind of uh, consolidate their position in that in that uh, country and in that society. Now, when we talk about informal acquisition, we're essentially talking about buying it. Um, it's, a, it's a form of corruption. And, uh, you know, and it's a, one of those very good examples where corruption actually has some very positive dimensions. Uh, <laughs> because corruption often allows you to get around the rules and regulations and to get what you want. And in this case, I think it's quite a healthy thing. You'll see it also amongst uh, Afghan refugees in Pakistan, where growing numbers of Afghan refugees are actually able to purchase uh, Pakistan IDs cards. Okay. Now, I think this is all very positive. Refugees are not just sitting back languishing in camps, being dependent on international aid, doing nothing to find solutions. They're out there doing lots of things to find solutions for themselves. At the same time, I think there are some limitations to the kind of strategies that I've just mentioned. Firstly, these refugees are finding themselves not in permanent solutions, but in inconclusive and reversible outcomes. So, for example, the Iraqi refugees in Jordan and Syria, they may be okay today, but their position in those societies is not at all underpinned by any formal arrangement or, or any legal basis. And, as you know, in a country like Syria, things could have changed very quickly. A new government could come into power and simply say it's time for the Iraqis to go back home. So, 
while they've found a certain kind of outcome, they haven't found the permanent solutions that UNHCR is obliged to find under the 1951 Convention. A second limitation is that certainly these household strategies spread the risk around different members of the household, but they certainly don't eliminate the risk. And you've only got to think of the boat that crashed on the rocks at Christmas Island. You've only got to think of the boats that go across the Gulf of Aden to, from Somalia to Yemen to see that uh, these household strategies do entail a very high degree of element of risk for some household members. Another problem I see with these strategies is that they do involve family separation, people moving in different directions in order to maximize their opportunity, but they also involve increased family pressures. What do I mean by that? Well, what we see increasingly is that refugees in the United States, for example, Somali refugees, Sudanese refugees, they come under tremendous pressure from household members who have remained in Africa to send money back. And in some of the kind of most tragic situations, Refugees in the United States, for example, have decided just to cut themselves off from their family because they can't stand the pressure that is being placed on them to remit money back to their relatives in Africa. And that is, of course, not at all a healthy thing. We've seen, because of these irregular secondary and onward movements, negative state responses. Again, I think uh, we don't have to go too far from Australia to see that syndrome happening. Host community hostility. Um, both here but also in developing regions, I think, you know, host communities do not always act in a very positive manner to people who arrive in an in irregular manner uh, when it's thought that they could have remained in a first country, a first asylum. It's not only in a country such as Australia, in Kenya, for example, there's quite a lot of hostility to Somali refugees who have managed to make their way to Nairobi and to establish livelihoods there. The tricks that people use to get resettlement these days, I would suggest, have questioned or even undermined the integrity of resettlement and I think for us that's not a very good thing at all. In fact, it's a very bad thing. And then finally, while many households are engaging in these new strategies to find solutions for themselves or at least outcomes for themselves, we have to come to terms with the fact that many still remain in camps. And I think the really shocking thing is that in many camps that UNHCR is working in around the world, the conditions today are worse for the refugees than they were 10 or 15 years ago. So rather than conditions gradually improving, which you would expect to be the norm, in fact, conditions have got worse over time because donor states tend to lose interest in refugee situations once they've persisted for some time. Okay, last slide. What's the way forward? Can we think of any constructive ways um, to take on board some of the issues that I've tried to raise. Firstly, I think we have to acknowledge the reality of, of mobility. We're in a globalizing world, we're in a more mobile world, and refugees are more, more, more mobile, just as everybody else is. We have to acknowledge the reality of mobility. The old pattern whereby people left their country of asylum, uh, sorry, country of origin, went to a country of asylum, and then at some point in the past went back to their country of origin. I think that's a very outmoded model. We have to think about the implications of m mobility. I think dual citizenship might have a useful role to play in acknowledging the reality of mobility, providing people with the chance to live in two countries, but to do so in a legal manner with the necessary identity documents. I think we need to look more closely at bilateral and regional freedom of movement arrangements. There's a very good example in West Africa where the ECOWAS organization, the uh, uh, Economic Community of West African States has established a freedom of movement protocol which allows citizens of all member states to move freely from uh, one country to another, a little bit along the lines of the European Union freedom of movement arrangements. And this, I think, could also uh, help to assist the search for solutions for refugees, and indeed a number of refugees in West Africa are already taking advantage of this arrangement. I think we need to expand but also formalize protection space. It's very good that the governments such as Syria and Jordan have allowed so many Iraqi refugees to come into the country and to remain there. But as I've already said, uh, their status is very informal and insecure and very reversible. And so I think we need to formalize the protection space that refugees such as those are currently able to enjoy. And we also need to move from this notion of de facto local integration to what I call de jure local integration, in other words, the, the whole nine yards, not just allowing refugees to stay in the country, but also providing them with citizenship, providing them with documentation, and in the meaning of the uh, UNHCR statute, enabling those people to reconnect with the state, even if it's not their own state. Another important thing, I may talk about this later in the day, I think we need to make sure that UNHCR's new urban refugee policy is fully implemented. 
Um, I think UNHCR has taken on board the fact that refugees are increasingly mobile and increasingly moving to urban areas, and we've established a new policy to uh, take that issue on board. And uh, as I said, I'll probably say something about that later in the day. And then finally, something that Rick Tao mentioned yesterday, we've been looking at the opportunities for refugees to enjoy regular migration opportunities. I'll just give you one example of that. I was in Malaysia about three weeks ago, and one of the people I was interviewing was a Burmese refugee, qualified doctor, who spoke almost absolutely fluent English. And he had joined the kind of resettlement queue, and he was hoping to be resettled to New Zealand. Um, our thinking at the moment is, well, is this a sensible arrangement? Why should that particular person take up... a uh, uh, um, a place on the humanitarian program, couldn't he actually find a regular migration opportunity given his skills, given his language abilities, etc. So we are looking at this notion of regular migration opportunities for refugees and we're hoping to set up a pilot project with Sweden uh, to see how that might work in practice. And then finally, we have to again acknowledge the fact that many refugees do remain in camps and have to do everything we can to improve standards there to stop the decline in standards that we've witnessed over the past 10 or 15 years. And with that, I think I'll come to an end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Very comprehensive coverage and some good ideas for us to think about. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. I now ask our next speaker, um, an old friend and colleague, Blooming Knight, from the Karem Women's Organization. In 2004, Blooming was elected Joint General Secretary of the dynamic Karen Women's Organization, whose 30,000 members work for the relief and development in refugee camps on the Thai-Burma border and with internally displaced people in Burma. Her organization has documented thousands of violations of human rights, including the sexual violence suffered by Karen women, as well as forced repatriation. Blooming and her group do some of the most inspirational work I think I've ever seen, and I go to a lot of camps. Um, Jeff mentioned refugees themselves taking action, and I think one action that Blooming has been very um, at the forefront of is the foundation of refugee NGOs who, with virtually no funding, offer support services, women's refuges, support orphanages, get, beg, borrow, I won't say steal training from people around the world and the people in the Karem Women's Organization I think are the mainstay of the camps and I have to say I think that while some of the international NGOs and NGOs fully support this and really assist others don't seeming to think that it's their job to run the camps and that they somehow have ownership of refugees so I think we really need to look at um, the excellent work done by Blooming the excellent support given by some INGOs and question ourselves how the rest of us can support refugees, not just by being nice to them and being charitable to them, but also by making sure that they themselves are using their full agency and doing what Jeff said, taking control of their own lives. Blooming, please. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> It's a good opportunity for me to share and present uh, the situation in our country. Uh, first, I would like to say that my presentation will be on civil society concerns with current state approach to resolving protracted refugee situations. So I think you need to know about the uh, background of the refugees. Um, Burma got the independence since 1948 and continued with civil war until today. And so the small number of refugees began since there. Uh, I'm a refugee since my mother's womb. My mother gave birth to me under the tree. In the next three days, we escaped from there. And today, I am a refugee about 57 years already. At the time, the Burmese military uh, made the focus operation in eastern part of Burma, the current state in 1974, and many of the villages were destroyed. Hundreds of the villages were moved to safe place. But in 1985, there were a major operation by the military Burmese, and so 
uh, refugees escape from their place, finding, finding the safe place, rescue place, and the number of refugees became more than 10,000. To manage the refugees, the Korean Refugees Committee was established in 1985, and the refugees were kept at the bank of Selwing, Selwing River on Thai, Thailand side. <clears throat> Concerning the focus operations, it means cutting food, finance, communication, and recruitment between Korean resistant group with the Korean villages. And from there, the Korean Refugees Committee had responsibilities on Korean villages until today, and it's about 26 years already. <coughs> about the camp management and supporting. The camps were controlled by Royal Thai Government, RTG, camp commander, and cooperation with KRC, Korean Refugees Committee, and Camps Committee. Korean Refugees Committee managed the camps and also cooperation with camps committee and section leaders. The Korean Refugees Committee managed the camps with traditional laws for many years, but today it practices with international law, uh, Thai law, and camps rules. The assets concerning crimes are referred to IRC, Legal Assistance Center. And the other cases, like domestic cases, are managed by the camp justice. Assist, but lack of women involved in the camp justice system. Thai justice is limited and moves too slowly, and lack of justice for crimes perpetrators inside and outside the camp. For camp support, it was services, uh, camp services are supported by NGOs, and UNHCR has the mandate for protection. Why protracted? No political changes and no democracy in Burma. There were elections in 1990, and the National League of Democracy Party was win. But until today, the military dis didn't recognize it and otherwise declare the new constitution in uh, 2008 and for civilian to recommend the constitution and again held the election in 7 November 2011 election and forced in some areas to elect the military party but after the election the next day started with fighting until today. No democracy, no chance to return. It is not a meaningful election and no achievement for any of the people, but only for the military. Human rights abuses are happen every day. Women are forced for labor, human shield, and rape during armed conflict. So no choice for the civilian only cross the border and to refugee camp. And after 26 years, it increased the protracted situation for refugees. Durable solutions of the three durable solutions, local integration is not an option. So let's see on the resettlement. Um, many of the refugees settled to the third country and raised some problems to the host country but then, for a good solution, I would like to say that before resettlement, the host country needs to consultation with civil society. If the host country is concerned with the civil society before resettlement starts, some problems can be solved. Last year, one country came to see refugees for resettlement and just told the CBOs confidentially. Then they prepared many things that they thought were necessary and took the refugees' families. After the first group had arrived for a few months, they came back to uh, community-based organizations and talked about many problems and unexpected things. That's why we need consultation before resettlement. Host country orientation on state law culture, language, services, and responsibilities. Otherwise, 
It's very limited time for refugees to understand the language and the customs on the systems in the new country. Most of the resettlement countries give only three days before departure, and it seems that generally refugees were very confused who, re who settled to the third countries. Uh, we also need the cooperation of um, civil community-based organizations, NGOs, UNHCRs, and host countries. There was some resettlement fraud here and there, but no one took it seriously. Is there a network between countries to solve this? This is my question. After the resettlement, I would like to say that I like some of the services from here and in other countries, but I also would like to add some more like learning about the refugees' background, understanding the refugee situation, study the anthropology to have refugees, and monitoring the services to be more effective. I would like to emphasize more on no repatriation. Before refugee, there are IDP, internally displaced people, more than 400,000. They lost their villages, all of their properties were destroyed by the military, hiding in the jungle, in the forest and in hillside, with no food, no shelter, no education, and no medicines. There are some re reachable area and many are unreachable area. So where to send refugees if repatriation? As mentioned above, human, right, human rights were abused and people were afraid of the torture, forced labor, military recruitment, rape, human shields as minesweepers and accession. Civil society concern on education. Uh, the funding will reduce half of the funding. Uh, the students were asked to pay their school fees in each level, including school building. So what is the meaning of free education for refugee children? They have to pay the schoolings because of fund reducing. And then, uh, for example, for a teacher or minimum, Income for a refugee, it's about $2.5 per month. And also health situation is poor situation as the funding were reduced. So many of the patients have to wait for their terms for referral system and some just wait, wait, wait and it seems that they have to wait for their day to die. On the food situation, the basic food ration has been reduced and refugees are expected to fill the gap for themselves by working or growing their own. In shelter situation, materials for shelter are only temporary and do not last for a long time. So we would like to more permanent materials like zinc roof, which will last for a long time and will serve some expenses. But then this are not allowed by the host country. So here is the suggestion. Community-based shelter assessment teams form, the in form that include women and flag community diversity, and then uh, to provide lights around the camp to, safe, uh, to, to keep safe and secure, especially women and children. For the new arrival, until today, there is no register. There were once in 1955, uh, sorry, 2005, and after that until today, there is no registered, and the new arrival were crowded in the camps. So I would like to, rec I would like to raise my recommendation here is to the military regime, the SPDC, to make nationwide ceasefire and uh, withdraw all the troops from the ethnic areas and, and uh, handle out the dialogue with the ethnic groups and NLD. Unless this happens, there is no 
political changes, and the, the refugees will increase, increase and suffer a lot of problems. To the Thai government, to allow the refugees to enter in the camp, register new arrival, no forced repatriation, to sign on 1951 Refugees Convention, and to practice the 1991 Refugees Convention. To the UNHCR, to consult with civil society before implementing all activities. Without, uh, without consultation, nothing happened. To recognize refugee leadership. To assess Royal Thai government for registration of new arrivals. Ongoing coordination and sharing information. To the international organizations and NGOs, maintain support for essential services, consult with civil society, and respect local capacities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Blooming, for giving us a picture of what it's like to be a refugee in a protracted refugee situation. I think Blooming's comments and recommendations really highlight many of the things that Jeff said and the reasons why refugees are taking alternative ways out. Um, there's so many questions I have for both Jeff and Blooming, but um, I won't abuse my privilege of standing at the front to ask them. I want to, but I won't. Um, but I would like to say that I think Blooming's presentation to me said quite clearly why um, refugees use what Jeff re referred to as tricks to get out of camps because to me those tricks are nothing more than a survival strategy to save the lives of my family, to give us a future. And as Jeff so clearly said, there aren't cues. <laughs> no, the resettlement's just a lottery. And I think the way Blooming has explained her protracted refugee situation, we can see why people who are looking after 26 years have no chance of going home, not being allowed to stay where they are, and a tiny percentage of people in the camp being offered the chance of resettlement with uncertain outcomes. People are going to do anything to try and look after their families, and I think that's the strength and the resilience of refugees and why we're all here to see what we can do to help. So with that, I'll open the floor to questions. I'll take three at a time. We have about 15 minutes. Wow. Well, eight, ten, two, three. We'll start at the front. I'll come back to you. Ten. Thank you for, for this presentation. I came in halfway through uh, this presentation, so I have no idea what I'm going to say in the first 15 minutes. Um, but I'm not a stranger to you know, this refugee <coughs> situation. I lived most of my life as a refugee in East Africa. Uh, in Ethiopia and Kenya, and um, thank you. Um, and, uh, Is that working? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and and one of the things that always sort of shocks me is when people talk about solutions to refugee uh, situations. Um, is, is that no one seems to talk about solving the, the reason for having the refugee problem. I don't know whether you did talk about that earlier, but that to me should be one of the things that should be in the forefront. So in Sudan, for example, where I come from, there was a war and there was a reason for it. No one talks about it. It's like, okay, if we want to solve these problems, we need to resettle people, we need to somehow repatriate people, it doesn't matter whether the problem is solved or not, um, or local integration, wherever they are. So to me, I just wonder why that is not articulated when people talk about UNSCR policy and solving problems. Um, the other thing for you, Jeff, is, is you know, when you talk about uh, refugees, you know, uh, sort of living this life, double life, where they move between borders and, you know, you know. I don't know whether you consider the fact that in some countries, for example, southern Sudan, uh, the border of Uganda and Sudan, people move between there because they are the same people, really. The Acholi tribe, for example. So you couldn't tell who is 
a, a, a Ugandan or who is a, a Sudanese. So uh, I don't know whether that sort of thing is considered in your um, sort of work. Thank you. Thank you. Could you pass the mic just behind you? Thank you. Thank you. I'm Florina from India, and uh, Dr. Crisp, I'd like to thank you, first of all, for saying that the refugees are not all languishing in camps and dependent on international aid. And that's really important to many of uh, the refugees who are very independent, taking care of themselves. So the one thing that I'd like to say, uh, you were talking about in the first part of your slide, from 1950 to 2000, from, from your resettlement to your paper on uh, no solution. And one of the things that we request in countries where the convention is not signed, like India, to engage with refugee communities, to be actively engaged with civil societies, with organizations that work, that organize themselves in the communities, technical support, uh, listening to us, using what we have, and that, that is something that we are really looking for from the units here. Another thing is women and children often get left out of you know, a lot of these uh, conversations because there are special needs that women and children have. So that's, that's really important for us. And at the end, you spoke about improving standards in the camp. The, the same thing, I mean, I'm talking about engaging with, with organizations that are working in the camp, like Offer Works in the camp, takes care of itself, all refugees. So to engage with organizations to see what is happening, how do they handle camps, and also learning from experiences like uh, Blooming just shared, from one to the other. And this is what we would request of UNHCR. Thank you. Thank you. I think it was yes. The lady with the green head scarf. Yes, uh, yes Munira from Melbourne. Uh, my question will be for Jeff again, because we're all uh, thinking about solutions. So solutions is a very important point for us. So in the point of implementing comprehensive solutions, you, you, you raised the issue of Somali uh, case failure because all of the government. If I go back to the Eritrean case in repatriation, which happened, and uh, I, I think it is not only the government, even the host country. So it have to be the solution between the host country, the government, and uh, the UNHCRs too. What, what support do they do in order for people to repatriate? If the government, they are ready, and the host country, how they really uh, work together. So what do you think, why that repatriation of the Eritrean uh, failed? Uh, what will be the issue? Because the uh, government have to welcome people and make ready places there. And then the UNHCR or NGOs also, they, they have to have a follow up for at least more than three years in order for people to, uh, to go. Then also people to choose where to go, not the government to choose for them where to go. So, and also the improvement of the standard of life in the campus would be a very important point. I think we keep talking about this. So if you can give me a few ideas, it would be a good solution. Thank you. Okay, Jeff, you've got five minutes to solve the problems. Yes, okay. Um, I'll take the questions as they came to me. Um, I mean, I couldn't agree more that, that kind of um, solving the reasons for refugee exodus is clearly the most important element of this whole equation. I guess the reason that UNHCR itself doesn't talk about much about this issue is because of our, if you go back to the statute that I mentioned earlier, one part of our statute says that UNHCR is a strictly, strictly non-political and humanitarian organization. And that's often been interpreted to mean that we should be very careful about talking about the political circumstances um, which have forced people to flee in the first place. We do say something about it, but we're, I would have to admit, very cautious on that. And we tend to leave it to civil society organizations, human rights organizations, um, solidarity organizations to make those kind of statements. What we do talk about, and it's a very technical and not a very elegant phrase again, we talk about creating conditions conducive for return. Now, that's a kind of a code word for saying we need political change in countries of origin. But it, it, it's a code word because of the sensitivities uh, around talking about political change, which clearly, as you've suggested, is absolutely fundamental if return is to take place in a voluntary and a sustainable manner. Um, I completely take your point about ethnic linkages, cross-border ethnic linkages, and a lot of the kind of backwards and forwards movements that I've mentioned uh, do take place in that kind of context, where it's the same with Afghanistan and Pakistan, the Pashtuns on both sides of the border. Clearly, this facilitates um, this kind of transnational lifestyle that I mentioned in my presentation. One of the problems about it that we haven't really come to terms with yet is that traditionally, 
uh, it's been a kind of a legal principle or a policy principle that if a refugee goes back to their country of origin, they so-called reavail themselves of the protection of their country of origin and therefore are no longer refugees. And I think we, we might need to rethink that because this cross-border movement backwards and forwards is taking, great, taking place so much now. Even with Iraqi refugees in Jordan and Syria, very significant movements of Iraqis who go back to check their property, to sell things, to see their family, but then go back to Jordan and Syria afterwards. So I think we might need, to, in the context of the solution issue, need to reconsider this notion that if a refugee goes back to their country of origin, they automatically disqualify themselves from refugee status in the future. Um, on the women and children issue, um, one of the studies we did recently, which was a really very interesting study, was to look at the movement of Somalis, Eritreans, and Ethiopians from the Horn of Africa all the way down to South Africa. And we tried to follow them the whole way, the whole 5,000 kilometer route uh, on the way down. What became very clear in the course of that study is that most of the people who are on the move making their way to, down to South Africa are young men of working age, normally between 16, 17, and maybe 30. And this is why I talk about household strategies, because I think you probably find that a lot of the women and children do remain in Dadaab refugee camp or another refugee camp, while the men make it down to South Africa to, in order to maximize the livelihoods opportunities that are there and perhaps send money back. So it uh, comes back to my point about a negative element of the refugee strategies that I was talking about, is that families are splitting, splitting up. And I certainly know that uh, quite a few of the refugees from the Horn of Africa who have made it down to South Africa subsequently split themselves off from their family and marry local South African women because this increases their opportunity for integration in South Africa. So I don't think that's a, a particularly healthy situation. Um, as far as Eritrea is concerned, um, as I said, I was in Sudan on the Eritrean border quite recently, and I think what is really not known about that situation, I think you know, the fact that refugee, Eritrean refugees have been living in eastern Sudan for 25, 30 years is relatively well known. What is not so well known is there's a continuing exodus of people from Eritrea. They're moving to Sudan initially. They don't see a life for themselves in Sudan, as I've mentioned uh, in the presentation. And so they're subsequently moving on northwards through Sudan into Egypt and subsequently to Israel. And I think as many of you have read the papers would know this is a very hazardous journey. Um, there's the risk of getting shot on the, on the Egypt-Israel border and uh, many, many other hazards. But again, it's, I think, a typical situation of refugees not seeing a life for themselves in a country of first asylum and therefore engaging in a fairly hazardous journey to uh, another country where they think that their life uh, opportunities might be somewhat better. Mm. Nothing to say yet? I can ask you a question. <laughs> because I, th I, th I think the problem with the kind of general analysis I've done is that you can always find cases that don't fit the kind of paradigm that I've tried to set out. And, and in terms of the refugees that you work with, is there a possibility of moving outside the camp and going somewhere else, or are they basically stuck there on a permanent basis? No. <laughs> <laughs> There is a camp law that the refugees are not allowed to go outside and also by the Thai authority. But then the refugee did because of a lot of problems inside and had to go outside and find out the work to provide some money for their families to stand to, uh, to survive their lives. And it's created a lot of problems. Do they stay in Thailand or they move? No, no. In Thailand, they dare not go back because of the current situation as I mentioned. Thank you. We've got a, a forest of hands and three more. So I'll go Linda, Pasu, and gentleman here, who I don't think has asked a question yet. Okay. Jeff, thank you very much for that fantastic presentation. I just wanted to say I was delighted that you changed your language when you spoke about resettlement to maximise opportunity rather than exploit. Because I think as you and I both know, so much about the way in which we respond to refugees and refugee protection turns on the language that we use to define the problem. And I've been deeply concerned in the work that I've been doing with refugees over the last 10 years, particularly focused on women and girls as you know, 
but also refugee communities broadly, that one of the consequences of the enormous pressure on resettlement as a solution in the absence of other protection solutions is that instead of moving to a situation where women and girls are getting greater protection and a move away from uh, sort of traditional denials of the incidences of rape and sexual violence. Increasingly what I'm hearing from NGOs, UNHCR staff, immigration staff in the field, when I raise concerns about the extent of rape and sexual violence in refugee situations, is a common response which is, don't you know that women just make up rape to be resettled? I'm hearing it more, not less, and I'm hearing it in discussions where we're not even talking about resettlement. So I'm concerned that in our failures as an international community to provide protection, we are again blaming refugees for our failures. How can we address this problem without ending up in a situation where we're denying the reality of women's and refugee lives? Thank you. Thank you. Hasu, could we... Sorry. Or maybe we could get the mic up to the gentleman. I'm sorry, I've got only three this time. Uh, thank you, Ellen. Uh, good morning. My name is Parsu, and my question is to Jeff. Jeff, uh, we have been hearing about the unregistration of the refugees when the new refugees are arriving in the Thai Burma border and, uh, and also in the other camps like in Nepal in refugee camp. And the, the, the main point we're hearing is uh, since 2005 or 6, no refugees, new refugees had been registered by UNHCR. And I understand that one of the problems UNHCR, UNHCR may say is that because the host government or host country does not allow. But is there not any way UNHCR will bypass the host government? Because we have the organizations like APRON, the booming, like so many civil society organizations. We're talking now, UNHCR is <coughs> pushing a mandate of engaging civil society. So why not in the prima facie basis register the refugee by UNHCR in consultation with all the organizations excluding Thai government and then put pressure at the most the Thai government need to give only the travel permit, nothing else. So why can't UNHCR adopt a policy on this? Thank you. Um, hello. Oh, hi, Jeff. Uh, my question's for you as well in regards to durable solutions for uh, stateless people. Uh, recently, we've seen a lot of the uh, asylum seekers arriving by boat, uh, uh, stateless people from Kuwait and from Iran. Uh, does UNHCR work for durable solutions for stateless people within the countries that they uh, are, originate from, uh, considering that many of them are not necessarily refugees, but they've been living there for uh, generations without, um, without status. Can I ask Jeff and Blooming to give three just uh, short answers to that, because I'm afraid, once again, time's beating us. Yeah, maybe I'll leave the question of non-registration to you, because I'm not familiar with the situation then. I haven't been there for quite a few years, and it'd be interesting to get your perspective on that. Uh, I mean, Linda, I take your comment very seriously. I can honestly say I've not heard any of my colleagues say people are making up rape to be resettled, but I'm not obviously going to deny that some people may well have said that. Um, just as a reference, I would really recommend a, a new book by a guy called Bram Janssen. It's called The Accidental City, and it's uh, a book about Kakuma. It's the best book I've ever read about a refugee camp. The chapter... Sorry, I'm just referring to a, a new book called The Accidental City by Bram Janssen, and it's a book about Kakuma camp in Kenya, it's probably the best book I've ever read on a refugee camp. There's a very interesting chapter in that book which looks at the resettlement strategies pursued by refugees. It doesn't cast doubts upon the genuine nature of their protection problems, but it does look at the, 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 the kind of maneuvers that refugees are forced into in order to uh, even get into the resettlement queue. So I would really recommend that. Um, yes, the UNHCR does have a mandate for statelessness, and it does work within the countries of origin to try and resolve the situation of stateless people. Um, it's not an area of our work that I'm 
particularly familiar with, but I certainly know, for example, that in Kuwait, we've been working on the Bidoon issue to try and get citizenship for those people, uh, and a much more tough nut to crack, the question of Rohingyas in, in uh, Burma, of course, which has uh, been persisting for many years and doesn't look likely to be resolved soon, but within our limited capacity in that country, we are trying to raise the issue of statelessness, um, which is clearly closely linked to the question of ref uh, Rohingya refugees. Well, um, concerning the question of the registered refugees, I would like to say that we, we pushed the UNHCR to talk with the royal government, but then UNHCR could not do on that because that is the country that not signed on the refugees convention, so they could not do anything. And we also asked to the NGOs, those who are working there, but they can. So it's really needed the UNHCR to adopt the policy and then review it or make something on that. This is our earnest request on that. Otherwise, we'll still suffering in the jail or in the camp. And I will certainly take this issue of non-registration back to Geneva with me and see if I can learn a little bit more about it and see if anything can be done. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank our two speakers.